Luke 24, verses 50 through 53. Again, next, next week will be two years that we were in Luke's gospel, and that, that was not planned. That was just preaching through the gospel of Luke, and we do that. I should say this more often. We preach through God's word because the last thing you need on a Sunday morning is one more person in your life telling you their opinion on things, politics, social stuff, whatever it might be. You don't need that up here. You get, that, you get enough of that throughout the week, people's opinions. What you need, what our culture needs, is fewer opinions and more truth. And that's what we get in God's Word. So that's why we spend time in God's Word. We don't skip over things. So that's why we've been in Luke, because we need truth. Our culture needs it. Less opinions, more truth. Here we're in Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 53. These are the final verses that Luke gives us. This is the final appearance of Christ in Luke's gospel. The final chapter in Luke's first volume. He'll pick up his second volume called the Acts of the Apostles. And what you'll see here is the theme in these three verses is the threefold use of the word bless or blessing. Um, you'll see that that's really the theme of Christ blessing his followers uh, in what is called the ascension. So let's look at these three verses this morning. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and we're continually in the temple blessing God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word and pray that we would hear truth, what we need individually, what our, our town needs, what our church needs, what our community needs, what Western culture needs. Hear truth as it is applied to us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless our time. May we, we grow in the gospel this morning and in the minutes that we have here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to read a couple sentences to you, just a very short little quote, and I want to see how many of you recognize these words uh, from an American leader. These are going back a few years, but I want to see. I'm just curious how many of you will recognize these words. I think many of you will. Just two sentences. Quote, I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead, end of quote. Some of you, I can tell, know exactly, okay, you, you remember, you're, you're, if I'm allowed to say it, old enough to remember those, those words. Those words came out, those were made public in November of 1994. Those were the, the words, the final words of a letter that former President Reagan wrote to the country announcing his diagnosis with Alzheimer's disease letting everyone know. And many of you probably remember when that letter was published. In the months previous to that, he had gone to the Mayo Clinic and gotten his health checkup, and there he was diagnosed uh, with that horrible disease. And he went home to California, and he went in the kitchen, and he got out a piece of paper and a pencil, and he wrote the note and gave it to his wife and said, let's, let's let the American people know about this. And so what's interesting with that letter is this popular former president who had done so much to strengthen the country um, really at the tail end of the Cold War, who had done so much to help an economy struggling with inflation and a recession. Similar problems that we have today, a recession and inflation. He had done so much for this country and had been a popular figure for many years. And now, at, in 1994, he was announcing that he was facing the ultimate challenge in his life, the challenge that would take his life. And he wrote the letter for a couple reasons. One, to let the American people know what was happening. Secondly, he said he wanted to raise public awareness of, about the disease, but also another reason with the letter was to essentially let everyone know that his public life, his life as a public figure was over. And if you think about it, he had been a public figure for about five decades, uh, first as a movie star, and then with the DuPont Network as a TV person, and then as a governor of California, and then ultimately as a president. He had been in public life since the 1940s. He had been someone people knew. And with that letter, he was saying, I'm no longer going to be a public figure. I'm no longer going to be in public talking or speaking or giving press conference or anything like that. The public life for former President Reagan was over. And that's really, really the, the central idea here of our text from Luke 24, which is that with the ascension of Jesus Christ, he is saying and demonstrating that his public life, his public ministry is over. 
As Reagan was departing, it's over. You're not going to see me anymore. Christ is saying, my public ministry is over. It's coming to an end. What, what theologians would call his state of humiliation, God taking on human flesh and, and living a humble life. I uh, read Philippians chapter 2. That is over, and now his state of exaltation begins. He's glorified in the presence of God the Father. That's beginning. So this is a transitional part of redemptive history. Christ is no longer going to be this public leader, public figure that everyone knows about. No, and instead, he's going back to the presence of God the Father. And so one chapter of redemptive history is coming to an end, which is the visible public ministry of Christ. And a new chapter is beginning as Christ leaves and goes to the presence of the Father. So let's look at this text. We're going to look at the story and see what it teaches us about God and about His church. And so here in the text in Luke 24, Jesus is back. He was dead. He is alive. We've seen that in the last several weeks in Luke's gospel. And he's alive. Last week we talked about his appearance to the disciples in that room where he appears and talks to them, shows them his body, says, do you have some fish to eat? Do you have something I can eat here? Demonstrating he has a body. He's not a ghost or a spirit or a phantom. If you were there, if your name was Peter or James or John, and you were sitting there with the, with the other disciples and, and the resurrected Christ is there and he's, he's back, what would you think? What would be your expectation of Christ when Christ showed himself again on, after his crucifixion? I think a reasonable thing for people to think would be, okay, the good old days are back. Christ is back, death is over, he's back, so now Jesus is going to do what he did before. The good old days are back. So like he did in Luke chapter 5, he healed paralyzed people. He healed lepers in Luke 5. That's going to happen again. In Luke chapter 6, he healed a man with a disfigured hand. That's going to happen again, right? In Luke chapter 6, he also gave life to the centurion's servant and to the widow's son. That's going to happen again, right? Or in Luke 9. Luke 9, Christ is busy. He's walking on the water in the Sea of Galilee. He's preaching to thousands. He's feeding what we call the feeding of the 5,000. Those things are all going to happen again, right? That's probably what Peter and James and John are thinking about. Jesus Christ, this rock star miracle worker, is back. And the good old days are back. That's what I would have been expecting. And maybe we take on the Jerusalem leadership. Maybe we go to Rome and make some things happen. Jesus is back, but it is not to restart or reset his earthly ministry. He's not going to be walking the hills of Galilee again with his disciples. He's not going to be publicly teaching anymore. He's not going to be publicly preaching. He's not going to be healing people or feeding thousands. He's not going to be casting out demons. He's not going to be confronting the religious elite, the religious leaders at the temple anymore. Those days are over. Things are totally different now. That's what this text shows us. Jesus is back, but it's a new chapter in the life of the church. It's a new beginning. It's not going to be like it used to be. Christ is no longer going to have meals with Peter and James and John and others. There's no longer going to be conversations with him physically. He's leaving. But the good news is Christ is leaving them, but he's not leaving them on their own. He's not leaving them alone. He is going to send them his Holy Spirit to empower them, to empower you, the church, today, 2,000 years later, and to empower you not just to manage your own life, which is difficult at times as well, but also to empower you for the redemptive purpose of God in His created world, which is to share the gospel, salvation through the death and resurrection of Christ, salvation through not works, but through repentance and through faith. That's why it's gospel, because it's been done for you. You just have to receive it. And so Christ has prepared His disciples for the fact that it's not going to be like it used to be. He is going to be leaving them. He's going to be departing. He's prepared them for that. And uh, we won't do a show of hands, but if you've, we've been in Luke's gospel for a couple years, can you think of any examples in Luke's gospel where Luke records that, that Christ was telling them there, there's going to be a difference, there's going to be a departure? Can you think of any examples in Luke's gospel where there was an indication, a foreshadowing of this ascension? Can you think of any? We won't, we won't call on anyone or do a show of hands. But there, there are several. There's, there may be more than this. There's at least four. If you remember in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, a lot happens in Luke 9. Uh, the transfiguration, what we call the transfiguration, there's this appearance of two individuals who've been dead for, I don't know, many centuries, Moses and Elijah. And you remember what they were talking about with Christ in Luke chapter 9? They were speaking of his, Christ's, 
in your English Bible, it probably says departure. In Greek, it's the exodus. Speaking of Christ's exodus, that he would be leaving them. Remember that, Luke chapter 9, verse 31? A second example in, in Luke 9. At the end of Luke 9, it begins, Luke begins the journey of Christ to Jerusalem. And in Luke 9, verse 51, Luke records that the days drew near for Christ to be taken up. His departure is coming. He's going to be leaving. A third example, remember in Luke chapter 22, we did that a couple, we preached on that a few months ago. Jesus appears before the religious leaders. He's been arrested. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 69, Christ says, From now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That doesn't happen if he's hanging out in Galilee or in Jerusalem. That is a reference to, there's an ascension. He's going to be in God's presence. A fourth example, Luke chapter 24, verse 26. We covered this earlier in July. The road to Emmaus, when Christ comes alongside these two pilgrims who are walking and begins to talk with them. And in Luke 24, verse 26, Christ tells them, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter his glory? Which doesn't happen in Judea. doesn't happen in Galilee. It happens when he returns to the presence of God the Father. Christ has told them, Luke has recorded, that he's not going to be with them forever. He's going to, he's going to, there's going to be an exodus. There's going to be a departure. It will happen. And you get a more detailed account of that from Luke, same guy, in Acts chapter 1. There's more details. But here you'll notice the end of, end of Luke's gospel, Luke is ending this story rapidly. I don't know if you picked up the pace here or noticed the pace changed. And that is because, as a lot of scholars have noticed, Luke has already written more than what most first century papyrus scrolls could contain. And so Luke's, Luke's verbose. He likes, he's got a lot of things to say. And he's wrapping it up probably because he's running out of room. He didn't have a computer. And so he's wrapping it up quickly here. And he tells us as he wraps up the story quickly that Jesus gathers his disciples at Bethany on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. We don't know from Luke chapter 24 when this happened, but Luke has part two, which is the Acts of the Apostles. And we know from Acts chapter 1 that the events that we read in Luke 24 happened about 40 days after the resurrection. 40 days after the resurrection. And Christ is here on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, and he's going to return to the presence of God the Father, which is, and, and write this reference down, this is a fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 23. Ezekiel was a prophet of the exile. Ezekiel 11 says, The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. So Ezekiel wrote in, in chapter 11, verse 23, The glory of the Lord would depart, would ascend from the eastern side of the mount of the city of Jerusalem. That, Christ is fulfilling that. He is the glory of God. He is ascending back to the presence of God the Father. And so here, Christ, as he's departing, he, he is giving a long blessing. It's not really, it's hard to pick that up on the text just by reading it, but if you think through what's happening here, this isn't just a, hey, see you guys later and I'm out. It's a long blessing to his disciples. And the word blessing here is the word eulogy, where we get our word Eulogy, right? Eulogy means blessing. That's what he gives them. He gives them a eulogy, a, a priestly blessing, which references back to Leviticus 9, where after Aaron the high priest offers the, the sin sacrifice, the burn sacrifice, the peace offerings, he gives a eulogy, a blessing to the people in Leviticus 9. That's what Christ is doing. It is a, a good word to the disciples, and it's a good word as Christ departs. Very similar to what heroes of the Old Testament would have done, like Moses in Deuteronomy 33. Moses gives a good word to the people before he departs. Or Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. He gives that, that long blessing. Genesis, several chapters, there's this blessing that Jacob gives before he departs. That's what Christ is doing. He gives them this blessing, and as he's giving this blessing, something happens that is really beyond the human comprehension, beyond, beyond human words, beyond what Luke can record in words for us to understand. He leaves their, Christ leaves their presence to enter the presence of God the Father. This is something that we can't really put into spatial, physical terms to physically understand what is happening here. As, as one scholar says, quote, the ascension always remains a mystery because it attempts to put into words what is beyond words. And it attempts to describe what is really beyond description. And so Christ's departure really 
instead of trying to think, through, how does this happen physically? Do we have, you know, what does Stephen Hawking think about this? How do we figure this out? Is there a new dimension? How does this work? Think about it more in terms of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch. Enoch was a close friend of God. And it says in, in chapter 5 of Genesis, Enoch, he walked with God, and he was not found, for God took him. He left and went into God's presence. Or think of 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. There's a prophet there named Elijah who's ready for retirement. He's been burned out for a long time, right? You read 2 Kings, read 1 Kings. Uh, Elijah's this great man who's just had it with the people of, of God. And it says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, that the great prophet Elijah is taken up from the presence of Elisha into the presence of God. Doesn't attempt to describe what's the science here, what does this do? You know, that's what happens with Christ here. He's in the midst of giving a eulogy, a blessing to his disciples, and he's leaving their presence and entering the presence of God the Father. This is beyond our understanding, physical, spatial terms. And I thought about it this week. I thought, you know, I spent four and a half years in seminary, got a couple of degrees. We didn't, we didn't figure this out when I was in seminary. And if I went back to the seminary for another decade, I wouldn't figure this out. And actually, as a quick aside, I did read an article by a theologian. I won't mention his name because it would be distracting. And it was about the ascension. And I read it, and I thought, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. Uh, and I read another review from another theologian out at Fuller, and he said, what does this even mean? So even attempts, sometimes attempts to describe this fall short, even in the academy, even in theological circles. What God's Word is saying here is not that Christ was shot up like a rocket, like Buzz Aldrin, into space. That's not what it's saying here. What it is saying is Christ left the presence of God's people, the disciples, and was in the presence of God the Father. How does that happen? We don't know. He's in the presence of God the Father. It's a lot to reflect on. It's humbling. And as that happens, Luke tells us that the disciples, these men who were faithless many times, cowardly many times, they respond in four positive ways. The story ends with four positive responses from the disciples. The first is this. Number one, they worship Jesus Christ. Can you think of any reference to people worshiping Christ in Luke's gospel? These are, this is kind of like pop quiz time today since we're coming to the end of Luke's gospel. A lot of questions here. There's not one reference to anyone worshiping Jesus Christ in the gospel of Luke. The closest you will get is in Luke 17 when there's 10 lepers who are healed and one comes back. It doesn't say he worshiped, but it does say he fell on his feet and gave thanks. So here for the first time, the disciples get it. They figure it out. Jesus is more than a prophet, more than a priest. He's more than a teacher. They worship him. This is the first time. So Luke's gospel ends with them worshiping. They finally figured it out. It took three years. The second thing that happens here is the disciples return to the temple. Remember, Christ told them, we talked about this last week, remain in the city, that's Jerusalem, until you receive power from on high. So go, go back to the temple, and they're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they return to the temple. And what's interesting here to think about the bookends of Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel ends with the apostles in the temple. God's leaders, his servant leaders in the temple. How did Luke's gospel begin? It began with a man named Zechariah, right? The father of John the baptizer, John the Baptist. Zechariah was in the temple. And so Luke's gospel begins and ends. There's a bookend here that Luke gives us. Begins and ends in the temple where people were initially supposed to worship God. The third response is they bless God. So they've worshiped Christ. They've returned to the temple. They bless God. They praise and bless him for what, what has happened. And then fourthly, their final response is this. They have an attitude of celebration. It says they were celebrating. They're worshiping. They're returning to the temple, which is obedience. So Talk about that in a minute. They bless God and then they celebrate. So there's no longer grief over, the, over his death. There's no longer confusion. Did he rise again? What happened? There's no longer doubts. What's, what's going on with Christ? Is he coming back? What are we doing? Are we starting the ministry again? Are we a 501c3? Are we a nonprofit? How are we going to do this with Christ coming back? None of that happens. They are celebrating the resurrection of the Son of God and his ascension. So what do we learn about this? What do we learn from this? What is God teaching us here? Let me give you, as there were four responses from the disciples, let me give you a four-point application briefly this morning. 
four points to write down this morning, and we'll go through these quickly. The first is this. After meeting the resurrected Christ, the response of of the disciples, their response was worship and obedience. They worshiped him. They put Christ above everything else in their lives, and then they obeyed him. Because remember in verse 49, last week we talked about Christ told them, remain in Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And it's only in our verses today that we find out that they were obedient to that. The disciples who often weren't obedient aren't here obedient. They went to Jerusalem and waited. And so for you this morning, if you know the resurrected Christ, your response is one of worship and obedience, if you know him. Worship, which begins on Sunday morning. It begins by gathering with God's people on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection. That is the the beginning of the Christian week. The beginning of your week is gathering for worship, and that's why it's important. That's why you should be in worship every week. And not only that, but worship on Sunday should correlate to how you live Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. That by worship, we mean valuing the triune God over all things. And that includes your career, includes your family, includes your education, your vacations. It includes yourself. In a culture of narcissism, it includes yourself. To value him above everything. And then secondly, it means you should obey him. And to be clear on that, obedience means not doing the things we like to do, which is what our culture would like you to do, but obedience means what does God tell us in Scripture because that's what I should do. Obedience means obeying what God has revealed in Scripture, even when it's not popular, even when it's not politically correct, even when it's not woke, even when it's not commended to you by whatever outlets you watch or listen to. Those are all irrelevant and at at best irrelevant at times. Sometimes they're harmful to your faith. We obey even if we don't fully understand what Scripture is saying on things, but we obey because, as Christ said in John's Gospel, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You will do what I ask you to do. You can't say you're a Christian and follow the Lord and say, yeah, but I don't, I don't like those verses in Luke. And that stuff that Paul writes about, and you can pick the things you don't like from the Pauline theology, I don't want to follow that. Well, you can do that, but that means you're, you're disobeying the Lord's word. And if you love him, you'll worship him and you'll obey him. So that's the first point. Is your your life characterized by worship and obedience? That's the first point. Worship and obedience is the natural response. The second point is this, and the disciples knew this very well, that with the ascension, you have an advocate and friend in heaven. You have an advocate and friend in the presence of God the Father. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you have a friend in heaven in God's presence. You have an advocate in heaven. You have an ally in heaven. And you need that reminder. I need that reminder because sometimes life is very easy and things are going great and everything's great, career, family, whatever is happening, everything's great. And it's like, you don't even think about a need for God, right? But there are other times when life is not easy, when life is difficult, when life is painful, and it might be a health problem. It might be a financial problem, a career problem. It might be a family issue, a relationship issue. It might be fill in the blank, whatever you're thinking right now. And you may be tempted going through a difficult experience, a difficult trial or chapter of life to think that God is mad at you. God's punishing you because he knows what you did last week. He knows what you did this morning, right? And it might be tempting to think, and Satan might use that to say, God's just, he's he's punishing you. You're not perfect, and so God knows that, and he's getting back at you. The text reminds us that that is not true. The text reminds us that we have a friend and an advocate in God's presence. When life is easy and enjoyable, he is your friend, your advocate, your ally. When life is painful and difficult and hard, God is on your side. He's not an enemy. You have the Lord Jesus Christ as an advocate. Paul calls him a mediator. The Apostle Paul calls him a mediator who is in God's presence on your behalf. And that should be a source of encouragement to you this morning when things are going well in your life and even when things are going poorly, that it's not God punishing you, getting back at you because he knows you did something, you said something, he knows what you thought. It's not that. You have an ally, you have a friend in the presence of God the Father. The third point this morning is this. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, the third person of the Trinity is given to the church, is given to you. We see that more Uh, detailed account given in Acts chapter 1, written also by Luke. 
where Acts 1 shows that Christ had promised the Holy Spirit, and then he kept that promise and gave his church, he gave you his Holy Spirit. And so the exodus of Christ, the departure of Christ, means the arrival of the Holy Spirit sent by the Father and the Son to the church, to you. And so you have that promise this morning, if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit is in your life today and tomorrow and next week and forever. And that is good news. That is good news because it means you're not on your own in the midst of life. It means you have, as, as Christ calls him in John's gospel, you have the comforter. It means God doesn't abandon you and say, you know what, you're on your own here. I can't handle this. God doesn't do that. He gives you his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, to put it in theological terms for a moment, he takes what Christ has done objectively through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and he applies that to you. He is the sanctifier. He applies that to you because everything, as John Calvin says during the Reformation, everything that Christ does for you remains alien outside of you until the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes and applies that to you. The cross is of no value to you unless the Holy Spirit applies that to you and gives you the gift of faith. Not the gift of good works to earn it, but the gift of faith to receive what Christ has done. And so the Holy Spirit is God's blessing to you. He applies the blessings of, of Christ's redemptive work to you if you belong to him. You have that promise. The fourth and final promise or lesson that we get here is this. The mission, the work of Jesus Christ is accomplished through you, through us, in the power of the Holy Spirit. The mission of Christ in the flesh ministering is over. It is the end here in Luke chapter 24. But the mission of God's people empowered by the Holy Spirit begins. It has started. He is, and it's a humbling thought. It's a scary thought. He's using people like me and you to build his kingdom, to build his church, to share the gospel, to invite others to hear the gospel, to invite others to church. The Holy Spirit empowers you to be a missionary, just as Peter and James and John and others were missionaries throughout the ancient Near East, throughout the, the, the Roman Empire in that first century. You are now empowered to be a missionary to the low country, to the coast of South Carolina. You are a missionary, not in your own efforts, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, not to convince people and persuade them. And do That's great if you can do that. Um, I've met few people, myself included, who are on that list of, we're not really good at that, uh, persuading people. But the Holy Spirit, that's his gift. That's his power, is to bring people in. And he just uses people like us, people like you. And so our task, our mission is the same as the disciples here, which is in the power of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. Our job is the same. And in fact, our job's a little easier than Peter and James and John because some of those guys were empowered to write Scripture. You don't have to do that. You don't have to write. And probably if you did, you might be in trouble. You might be starting a cult. And you might have a visit from me or Gary or Devin to say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You're not writing Scripture. Your job's easier. My job's easier. We don't have to write anything. We just have to share the gospel, share what God has done with us. And the Holy Spirit enables us through our words to be in our, our actions, to be a witness, to be a missionary to others. Several years ago, maybe almost a decade ago, um, I became friends with another Presbyterian minister, uh, an ARP minister who was up in Somerville. And some of you probably remember him, probably um, remember him uh, visiting our church when you'd have a Sunday off um, and, and remember him. His name was George Bush. And I remember when I met him, and he said, I was like, he, he knew what I was thinking. And he said, yeah, I know, it's B-U-S-C-H. It's like, not, I was like, okay, not, not George Bush, George Bush, okay. Well, George, some of you remember, remember him. George was the pastor in Somerville at, at the ARP church there, Scott's Kirk. And George, for, for, after I met him, he became a good friend, a good man, a good pastor, got to know him. And, and several years after I met him, uh, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he was, I think he was in his, mid-60s, early 60s, which as most of you know, all of you probably know, is a serious diagnosis. Um, and the doctors said, you have about six months to live. The doctors gave him six months, and God gave him about 18 months, which was a, really a blessing because he just had a couple uh, grandkids that were born uh, to one of his sons, and so the Lord was merciful and gave him just more time with his grandkids. 
But as George's health deteriorated, it was clear that short of a divine miracle, uh, George was not going to make it. George was going to die. And his health was fading. His body was failing him. And ultimately, he had to stop his treatment because... He, was, he wanted to have some measure of comfort before his life was over, and so he stopped treatment. A couple weeks before he died, I went up to his home in Somerville to talk with him because I knew uh, death was, was near and wanted to go talk to him. So I went up, drove to Somerville, and actually I remember knocking on the front door, and nobody answered, rang the doorbell, and thinking, he, I know he's here. I, I know he's here. And so I kind of walked around back behind the house, and he was back there, uh, he was sitting there with a drink, just relaxing on a, on a little chair, and his wife Brenda was on a swing, and they had their, their newborn infant grandkids were there, and George was just sitting in the backyard. And so I sat with him, and he, for an hour or so, he talked about his ministry, his life, his family. We had a good conversation. But then after a while, I could tell it, you know, he, he, was, he was getting fatigued, and it was time for me to leave. And so we wrapped up our conversation and talked for a little bit and then prayed, prayed for him, prayed for Brenda, and for his family, and our time was over. And as I left, I knew, and George knew, that was the last time I was going to talk to him. We both knew that. We both even talked about that. We both knew he was going to die soon, and he died a couple weeks later. I shared that story. It wasn't a sad story. Don't be sad. It's not a sad story. I didn't leave his house sad, knowing that George was going to die. I knew he was going to be gone, but I left there knowing that his struggle with cancer was soon going to be over, and he was struggling physically. And I knew when I left there that he was going to be in the presence of God, that while I wouldn't see him anymore, I knew where George was going. I knew his his life, his existence, whatever you want to call it, was going to improve infinitely in the next few weeks. And so it wasn't a sad departure, to be honest with you. We left there with, with, I left there with hope, and I think George... When I left him, he was in good spirits. Luke's gospel ends the way my meeting with with my late friend George ended. It doesn't end with grief and crisis leaving and what we're going to do. It doesn't end with any disappointment. It's an ending, but it's also a beginning, not with despair and with doubts, but it's a, it's a, a new chapter's beginning. It's a beginning with hope. The story ends with expectation. Christ leaves them with hope and expectation. He's not going to be with them anymore, but that's okay. He was dead. He is alive. He's now in the presence of God the Father. That's why the disciples could have their last time with him be filled with joy and celebration because they knew their future is secure. They have the promise of the resurrection. And because of that, we can embrace the mission that God has given his church to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, to invite others to our church because we know that one day this will be over. This will be over and we'll be in God's presence. And until that day comes, which, which might be today, might be tomorrow, might be in a thousand years, a million years, nobody knows. Until that day comes, Christ says, you know what? I, I'm giving you a meal, a sacrament, as a foreshadowing, a foretaste of what will happen, which is described in Revelation 19, a meal, a feast, a festive celebration of, of Christ in his church in Revelation 19. Until I come back to encourage you, to remind you that what you've heard reminds you in a tangible way through through bread and through juice, I give you this sacrament because that's what's coming. It's a foreshadowing. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, we end Luke's gospel. It's not with despair that Christ is gone, but it's with hope. It's with expectation of what is coming for each of us if we're trusting in the Lord. So think about that. Reflect on that. Reflect on God's promises to you this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Let's pray.